Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, new museumexpert.org event. Um, we are hosting today a conversation with Elaine Herman Gurian. And uh, we are waiting a couple of minutes that all attendees are joining the room. And then we will uh, start. So we are ready to go if we can now uh, have the view of the speakers. Great. Well, again, welcome everyone uh, and welcome Elaine. Uh, and we all are preparing for a conversation between you and America, uh, Castilla. Castilla. Uh, and unfortunately, as, as many of us here in the room can see, you are alone. And the reason is that America, America has a serious uh, health issue since yesterday that we discovered yesterday. We're not going to go into details of that. It's, uh, he's totally unable to, to join today, and, and he's very unhappy with that. And, and we will do the best we can to, to replace him. So I'm sorry for our friends from Latin and South America. We're looking forward to that. But uh, I also know that many of them has asked to have translation, which there was going to be translation in Spanish, which is not the case. But we discussed it yesterday with the team, and our idea is to, in a very, in a very near future, to organize something with him and maybe in Spanish directly, so that that his, his friends and people who were looking at his contribution here would be able to. Uh, to listen to that as well. So sorry again for that, but welcome, Elaine. Uh, we will have a conversation between just you and me then, and I, I hope that I can replace Americo in a, in, a, uh, in a good way. But let me do some kind of uh, home, home, uh, housekeeping first. Um, and first of all, we, we have to thank uh, AAM again uh, for uh, providing the Zoom platform to us because they, they, uh, they do it every time we have a significant a significant event and so we're really grateful for them to do that so this will be recorded as well and be visible on both the museum expert website on youtube and the am website as well so uh, a few other things about the, the organization here is that we will uh, provide we have we are supported here by eric havel and rita diedrich from museumexpert.org uh, two from our, our leadership team they will uh, monitor the chat and the Q&A. So please feel free to add your questions or remarks marks in both of these places, preferably in Q&A. And at the end of this session, we will, they will uh, come up with uh, what they have found. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the other thing is during the conversation, look to the chat because we're gonna provide you with a number of links that are relevant to the conversation. So you can, you can go and, and, and save them for your, for your own benefit. So uh, please, let's, let's start. I think someone said that there was a, a problem with my sound. Is that correct? But I'm gonna try that, see if that's better. Thank you, Sylvia, for saying that. <laughs> uh, here we go. Elaine, again, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I will give a very brief introduction about who you are because uh, who doesn't know you in the museum field is the question, right? So you have been uh, in the field for so many, so many years uh, and uh, you have been a director yourself. You have been uh, a, a consultant. You have been 
coaching directors, you have been a teacher, you have been a speaker, uh, you, you, and, and, and you have been a writer in, in, in articles and books, especially. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the people know certainly the, uh, the main titles that you have been producing. Civilizing, 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 civilizing the museum. I was going to make it, and the institutional uh, trauma, uh, which is a book about how change, uh, major changes in museums may affect uh, the personnel that is uh, working there, and that is something that we, as museum experts, of course, are, are very interested in. And both of these books somehow reflect in the last one that we that we're going to talk about today, which is centering the museum, the post-COVID writings. Um, and, and so let me first uh, ask you, uh, you, you have started that book in the introduction and other uh, comments, mentioning that you have looked at the museums and you have observed the museums as you have been doing for so many time during the COVID period. And that in the first period, what you have seen was that museums tried to get back as quickly as possible to what they were doing before, without actually thinking how the, how the crisis might actually change the place they had in society or the role that they had. And then you were a little bit disappointed by that. They were only focusing on uh, social distancing uh, and, and maybe inclusion, that those were the two things that came up to you. And you said that was a little bit disappointing. So can you give me a little bit of examples of why you came to that conclusion in your first phase of thinking about the reaction of museums to the COVID uh, crisis? Um, thank you, Walter. And thank you, everybody. I know um, people are disappointed that Mako is not here, Americo is not here. And those of you who know Americo and me together know that we have been talking about this in, uh, for decades. And also, if you get my book, you will realize that uh, Mako writes the forward and talks about how we've had this conversation. Um, you are seeing me in Vieques, Puerto Rico, where I live for a half of every year. Uh, you can both, if you're cold, you can envy me. Um, but I find uh, Vieques, Puerto Rico, an extremely interesting place in which to study museums, though we only have one, um, and to think about what rural countries are like. Um, I think in the human nature of museums, when they found themselves shut, closed in this um, overwhelming pandemic, their first thought was, let's see how we can survive and then as soon as possible become museums as we know it, as we're organized to do. So I don't fault them though, their rhetoric was often about um, let's open differently. But in the intervening time when museums were shut for the first time, uh, the racial reckoning took place, uh, a pandemic, a worldwide catastrophe took place for most of the world, except the elderly like me, the first time they had ever encountered such a thing as possible. And I was hoping that museums in that moment, knowing how much work they had not done um, and wanted to do, would use this opportunity of being closed to rethink their basic premises. And at least in the beginning, they didn't do that. What they did was we can survive this interregnum by enhancing our distance learning. So the first thing you will notice about every museum was that they got themselves um, much more sophisticated about distance learning and much more sophisticated about access to their collections and access to the information they had. So they didn't do nothing. And in fact, where that secondary visit, the distance learning visit, the visit on your computer had been under some discussion, was it as good or as bad as the real thing? That went away and museums became much more comfortable and much more expert. 
What I was disappointed about was that I think very many basic thoughts about museums itself, where they sit in society and what their opportunities are, need to be rethought in some fundamental way. And while I personally don't like the term systemic racism, I like the term systemic a lot. That there are many, many leftovers in the way in which museums operate, how they speak to staff, how they speak to their visitors, the way in which they think about what their obligations for collections, care, and presentations are, that they have not gone back to the basics to rethought, think. And it was my hope that during this time they would totally rethink that. They would think, rethink about the world of work, the meaning of work. Um, they would rethink about access to collections. They would rethink about things like indoor and outdoor space being one. They would rethink about their role with other groups of society. And in the beginning that you would see small bits of that, um, but very little of it. And now you see much more of it. Now that this pandemic has been so long that people couldn't wait it out, you are seeing, I'm less disappointed. But I hope the conversation is mostly about what is the basic rethinking yeah. that I was hoping they would do and well, yeah. how they would do it. <laughs> yeah. And so just, just maybe a, a secondary question. Was that all over the world in the same way because you have connections all over the world? Did you see differences in that reaction maybe? Um, if you look at the, if, if the question means in a, in a um, mathematical sense, the whole world behaved similarly. What I look at and what I would ask your your attendees to look at is what I call green shoots. The, the singular people trying out singular things as experiments. Yeah. And in that regard, I saw experiments going on all over the world in about equal measure. That is brave people not being held back um, were in fact experimenting. So I would ask everybody who is listening to look at singular e experiments as being very important, even though numerically they are not important at all. Mm. Yeah, and we will come back to that during the, the conversation, I'm sure. So you said you will hope to speak about the things that you have seen and the changes that, that, that and, and, and the concept that people are changing. So how, how do you like to address that? Uh, do you have examples that you want to give us that have that, that, that given you hope that things are changing? Well, all the social, all the notion of museum as a social space that needs to be responsive in, in uh, social events, give me hope. So, um, those museums who are now delivering COVID tests or who are delivering vaccines inside their building, who are looking at their building as assets, give me hope. All the people who look at their Wi Fi as a resource for the community, give me hope. All of those who, like the Anacostia Museum, make free food available on their front lawn, even though they're closed, give me hope. So in every category, um, the, uh, the um, sites of conscience who have just gotten themselves to a four day week and reorganized themselves to think about work from home as a, with different hours gives me hope. So those people who go way back to the way we do things um, all give me hope. And I collect those examples, but I would also say to you, Walter, that there are many blogs who also collect those examples and 
for everybody listening, you can have your own list of your own favorites by going to five or six different places who are very interested in seeing people go way back to fundamental ideas and change their way of doing things. And, and that is close to, to what is the basic way that you think about the whole, the whole concept, right? What you used yes. to say is that all your actions are based on philosophy. Yes. And all what your actions signal what philosophy you have, right? So can you yes. get a little bit more in depth on that? Well, I, I teach that um, every action is philosophy or philosophically based, it sounds better as philosophy, but and that things that you think are unrelated are not unrelated. I think I train two things, everything is philosophy. And the other thing is that everything is both a signal and a metaphor. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, it is both itself and a signal to the users about what your intentions are that your intentions are more transparent than you think. And um, things like what the uniform is on your frontline workers is a signal to your audience about how you think of them and what you want us to feel about them. So it is really in these tiny actions, um, all things are philosophy. The easiest example is always do you put your money where your mouth is? If I look at your budget and I look at your mission statement, will they match? If they don't match, I don't believe your mission statement. So it's the tiny actions of practice. And I am by profession, a deputy director. I know you said that I have been a director and I have, yeah. but, but that was an anomaly. I am a deputy <laughs> director, I'm the person who loves to run the place. And I'm interested in the outcome of philosophy. And I'm thinking that you have to know philosophy, but it has to be put in practice and that every single practice you make is building on that philosophy. Right, so, and that includes the fact that very small actions can actually signal a lot of things. Right. All small actions signal a lot of things. Yeah. There so, is no neutral action. So can you elaborate a little bit about that? Because I know that, that uh, you say that changes that people make uh, and the change that you are looking for is in these small actions that people take, right? So the, the, can, and in particular, the example that you gave is about inclusion and diversity. But, and, and we can speak about that, but maybe there are other examples as well. Well, one of, oh, somebody said, welcome America. So America oh God, may, yeah. be, may, may be here. <laughs> oh, he is here. I wonder if you can put him on the, on the Zoom. Oh, great, Mako. I'm so glad you're here. Um, he can, um, he can uh, put his camera on and... Uh, Mako, if you put your camera on, let me go back and give you examples while somebody talks to him. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> um, um, let me give you an example that I wrote a, a, a piece about called Open Your Lobbies. Um, during the summer when Black Lives Matter was happening, it was uh, hot and all the institutions in the country were closed and therefore people protesting could not use a bathroom or electricity to replug their phones or get water or just sit in the shade. Yeah. Every, yeah. Everything was closed. It was in big canyons yeah. of closed yeah. buildings. And in that moment, theaters opened their lobbies. They made it possible for people to get the ordinary amenities. And museums by and large, though not completely, did not. And they had many reasons they said they did not, but if it's philosophy, that is if your intent is to say to the populace, when you pre peacefully demonstrate, we have assets that keep you safe, they would have and figured out ways to 
overcome whatever their difficulties were. So that's an example, a small example, but a big one about what do you think about the populace outside your door? Where do you think your private space begins? What responsibilities do you have when a hurricane hits? And are you opening your doors to let people sleep overnight? Are you a shelter? Well, in the history of museums, many museums, but numerically small, have believed they were a shelter. So I separate in the small sense, though this is a, 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 often not small, that your physical asset is an asset of the community, not a private asset. And therefore, how much money you charge and where your front desk is and how you're greeted at the front and where food service is and how it is that the label is written, all of that is signaling what you think of me. And I'm hoping that you, everybody who enters, even the homeless, will feel welcome because the homeless are not a surprise to you. So we're gonna try something here because America is here. <laughs> uh, can you hear me, America? Yes, yes I can, but I really cannot speak. Okay, so you're just there to watch and, and okay. So then we're gonna continue and, and, and thanks for doing the effort to, to show up and, and uh, in, in your condition. I think everybody is, uh, is appreciating that. Uh, so building on that, what you just said, uh, I think that, that you were also a little bit critical about how museums in that period uh, of COVID and with the, the question of systemic racism, even if you don't like the term so much, that there was more lip service to it than real action. So can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Well, the part that I want to speak about most in terms of, of about hiring is that the most essential work needs to be done in the HR department. In the assumptions about the names of jobs, their requirements, the assumptions about what we think of families and family responsibility, how our policy of, um, of time off works. And now, of course, the big one is about distance learning and support, I mean, distance working and support to that. Um, yesterday, as an example, but it's, a, it's an example here in Puerto Rico, I run, an, I run a disaster relief organization here on this island, and I looked up the community liaison job description in many places being posted for many different organizations. And by and large, the wording of that job, though it was about community work, was you, the organization, giving to the community. Almost none of the jobs had rewritten so that this is a stakeholder to stakeholder conversation. And almost all of them demanded that you had a bachelor's degree in something related to community work. And almost none of them said you had to be from the community. Exactly. So, so this notion that you have a good heart at the bottom of each of these, it's all said about equal opportunity employee and all of that. But this notion that you have not only a good heart, but you want to work with the community, but only on your terms. So um, that's where the small thing, could we rewrite our jobs? Could we reorganize what they get paid? Could we look at pay bans to reflect the sense that we're talking about inclusion? What do we really mean? If we're talking about people who need to work with us who come from various backgrounds, then we need to talk about how we code their various backgrounds in the most appropriate way, rather than looking at education as the most formal way we code them. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and we had a session about that a couple of months ago where, where these points were made. 
But the additional point then, once these people are hired, if you do all these changes in HR and you have a more diverse, diverse staff, how do you make sure that the vision that they bring uh, and the different concepts that may, they may have about the role of your institution in the community, how the, are they taken into account? Are you really ready to do that? Or is it just enough to have a diverse staff? Well, nobody is ever ready for a change. Yeah. And so the question really is, and here we're up to centering. The question is, is there forgiveness in the room for learning? Is there some notion that we are a work in progress, that we call each other out, but that we are progressing in some act of love, some act of reshaping, some act of relearning? And what centering is about, and centering is the most right wing of my political beliefs I've ever had. Yeah, and, and, and you're not going to disclose that now because I was keeping that for the end. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, but one of the things is that the word inclusion is an easy word to understand, but a very difficult word on the small things to look at. For example, in when I worked at the Holocaust Museum and we had diverse staff, there was sufficient number of us that we could make jokes in Yiddish and they were very funny. What we needed to learn was that our obligation was to translate them. That was not make the assumption everybody in this room can understand that. And therefore it was a learning process for everyone that if there's a joke on the table, everybody is in on the joke. Nobody meant harm, but nobody had been trained in the small avenues of making what they, this big philosophy work. And so that, that, that makes me think that that relates somehow to another concept that you have is that many people that are facing COVID now, they, all, they see that as the only disaster that they have ever seen in their life. And, and so they, they, they don't think there is anything to learn from other types of events like uh, world wars and, and, and things of that or big catastrophes or anything like that. And, and COVID should actually be learning how people have been reacting to that to see how they can do act now. So that's, I, I think that I learned that from you, that that is <laughs> some, some, some aspect that you wanna address in saying, this is a, a disaster, but it's not the first one. Things have happened before, what can we learn from that? And absolutely, and let me reset the stage because I came to this from being uh, the daughter of immigrant German Jews who come to America before the Holocaust and who then spend the Holocaust years trying to save their family. So the Holocaust is present in my childhood even though I am American born and even though I am seemingly safe, the terror of the disaster going on is present every day. And when Trump became president, one of the things that was very clear, and if you read my book, you see it over and over again, um, and we can talk about personalizing work, which is we, one yeah. of the issues, yeah, yeah. Um, that we had seen, we the Jews, especially children of immigrants or people who had lived through being alive at any of this, had seen a Trump figure before. And we had something to say to the world about what this means. So in the same way, the, this pandemic, is not even in living memory the only pandemic that some very old people have, have endured because the Spanish flu existed at least in the memory of others. My mother was um, afflicted with the Spanish flu. But also that person, that's very small catastrophes, Hurricane Maria, earthquakes, all of that, put the kind of stress on museums, even in the short term, 
that this is put on museums in the long term. And there is much to learn, especially about war, because that's a sustained catastrophe that will help museums about COVID. So is there any recommendation then from things that they should look at in, in their daily operations where there is no catastrophe that they would say, how am I preparing for that? Yes, and that's back to my sense that you own in a museum a set of assets. And the assets are, of course, your visitors and what many people want to concentrate on, which is your collections. And many people think of the housing and the visitors and the amenities as all focused on the real reason you came, which was to go and see our collections and learn our content. But if you separate them all, there are many things about museums that become assets of themselves. One is that museums are safe spaces for strangers. It's one of the most declining assets in any perilous situation. And that museums who have made themselves safe space for strangers, that is strangers believe they can enter the door and leave the door unharmed. And, the, and while that sounds very dramatic, um, in places of contest, that's the first thing that go. People don't go shopping, they don't go to the mall. If they believe it's owned by someone else and they're in danger, that's why terrorists hit um, public streets and big shopping areas, not only because there are a lot of people there, but because it destabilizes the sense of safety in the community and you own one of the most important stranger safe locations. So you can think about that separately. And you can think about your physical place separately. You have heat and light and toilets and water um, and all those things. And in catastrophe, they are in short supply. And if you think that way, then you think I am responsible for a larger community here and I, the museum, have assets that I need to make available. And those are a kind of bedrock thinking that I tend to do. So maybe a side question here. Uh, and that's something that intrigued me all the, all the way uh, since a long time. Are the differences in that perspective between the museums is a science in particular in COVID, a science museum a different role than an art museum well my answer is that they all have the same role but they think they have different roles so and the public thinks they have different roles so the public the broadest visiting public believes the zoo and the botanic garden and the aquarium are more public and next comes the science museum and the children's museums are more public and the least public, the least for me in particular is the art museum. When I think of them as all the same and it's just a matter of willpower, it's a matter of determination about what your, what your collections are and who you wish to have access to it. Outdoor space is um, easier for a much broader public. And that's one of the ways to think about it. So I wrote a paper a long time ago called Threshold Fear, that one has to make a decision to enter a museum's threshold. And therefore, in COVID, when we close the threshold, we should have and should now have made huge use of the public space, especially outside, especially when people could physically act on the outside and remain safer in COVID. So once you start to believe the public space is yours and your assets are there, you start to rethink um, again, what your basic role is. And there are many examples of people using the outside space. Yeah, and, and 
so that brings me then to the next topic is that uh, you, you believe that small examples of experimentation, of bravery, even you use the word bravery, uh, uh, have outsized influence in, in the museum field. And that you can, can you talk on how small scale is more nimble, a nim more nimble arena in which to incubate change? Well, uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I'm speaking on your webcast precisely because I come from small museums doing small things where we thought nobody was taking notice. That, and Mako comes from Argentina where they make everything out of what I like to call smoke and mirrors. So their fear about who's watching them goes away and they get less afraid. So the more august you are, the more famous as a museum, the more you have the icons of civilization, the less willing you are to experiment. And the smaller you are and the least under siege and view, the more willing. And then there's a process. And in my book, I wrote a paper called Being the Third on Your Block about how that brave experiment slowly makes its way into the museum world so that the Uffizi, and I don't mean to denigrate them because I like them a lot and I like when big museums do things, but they have just discovered that there are children visiting museums and they are making very big hoopla about making things available for children and where they hang their, um, where they hang their pictures and if they have seats and now they have guides for them and they write special labels, all of which is fantastic, but was originated 20 years before elsewhere. And that's the way in which it happens. It comes slowly. But when the Uffizi, which I referred to as the second on your block, makes it a big thing and public and wonderful, then it, it's okay for everybody. Because being the third on your block that is following the second is much easier. So actually you, you describe the notion of museum influencers, right? To, to use a modern term. Well, yeah, and I sometimes refer to them as, you know, they have a death wish. They often can't help themselves. Uh, people who, who really change things, um, they really are compelled to do that. But there's a second thing that happens about them and that in today's media, like influencers, they get very well known outside the system. In some ways, I like to say cynically that um, people, for example, come to hear me speak so they don't have to do it. It's a, it's a substitute for action. And so, the outside of the influences, if they're really doing experiments, they get a they get public notoriety way outsized their singularity, which is the way people then start to know what they're doing and then start to think about it and then start to modify. So, and and this personal role and doing small things relates uh, to to another notion that you have which is that uh, personal biography, the people's stories, is the best way to deal with, with the relation uh, between your museum and the community. So that your own personal story uh, is the most important part of how you are as a professional in the field. So I, I came into the field um, in the 1970s and I am a, obviously a woman. Um, and in that time, um, my father was a highly successful immigrant. He came to America to make his fortune and did. And he believed clearly the prevailing view, which was work is work and private is private. And in today's world of um, certainly about um, racial history and racial 
uh, integration and comfort and um, DEAI, you have to start with where you are because it is not deniable. And I learned this from my Native American colleagues and I was the deputy director of the National Museum of the American Indian. What they were the most frightened about was that I as a, a non-Indian wanted to be them, that I would study them, that I would imitate them. And the fact that I was a Jew from their point of view, or at least from the people I met point of view, signaled to them that I accepted who I was and therefore they could be in no danger that I was out to copy them or usurp them or any of that. And that notion is you start where you start, you come from where you come, you have your bare face hanging out, your prejudices come with you. And the only way that any of this community work might work out is if you are willing to lay that on the table and then willing to, and it's painful often, to see where that interferes with somebody else's view of themselves and their life and their success. But the part that is not takeawayable, which is I am who I am, I'm this age, I came from this time and I have these parents, I try very hard to put on the table right away so that we can negotiate from reality. And that I hope that I am good-willed enough and guilty enough to then move from that position to where somebody else is coming at me from. But that they too have to take into account as I have to take into account where they are coming from that that's who I am, that there is nothing even apologies will do about it. So I made a decision as a woman 50 years ago that I would not separate my personal life from my work life. And my, I brought my children to work and people, I had friends at work and that it was a tool, but it was also unavoidable. So I made no distinction. And I wrote about it in the AM in Museum News when I was quite young. And um, I got a lot of pushback from women in the museum field who thought that I was compromising their rise in the field. So which then quasi naturally brings us to, to the last point. And, uh, and, and this is about why how does that relate to centering the museum? And as you said earlier, this is most, one of the most right-wing visions that you have ever expressed. So uh, lead us a little bit to your journey to come to that concept of centering and what centering actually means. Well, to me, the United States where I live uh, is in a very perilous state about democracy and that the moment when I realized that democracy was not bedrock of the United States, I realized that museums had an opportunity to do something about, about welcome that included people that I was afraid of under certain conditions. That not only did we have reparations to make about who we had left out and had wronged, but we now had an obligation to try and center the whole panoply of our citizenship so that it could at least have dialogue with each other. That the silos of information and the, and the physical silos of what we were doing needed to be addressed by museums themselves. And that the the conversation and the way in which we did exhibition had to radically change from sound bites to enabling people, to allowing people to make their own decisions and to believing in their own journey. And that, that I called centering. Thank you. 
that it was all of us, including the people who, frankly, I was, as I said, afraid of, that we needed to consider. And the center of American politics, of the United States politics, is very discredited at the moment. It's considered not only wimpy, but compromise is considered discredited and purity has more value than it should. And so I was for the first time looking at a more moderate political stance in a way of helping with what I hoped was the support system for democracy. So that's all in your book. And so we, we invite, of course, our, our attendees to, uh, to, to take advantage of, of, of the, uh, what will appear on the screen later on, the, the discount that your, <laughs> that your uh, editor gives us for, for, the, for the museum expert members to, to buy it, uh, and, and they will learn much more about it. It's time now, I think, to go and see uh, with Rita and uh, Eric uh, about the questions that came up. I see one, but uh, Rita and Eric, I'll hand it over to you to moderate these last uh, 10 minutes here. Great. Yeah, thank, I was going to say thank you. Thank you, Walter. And thank you so much, Elaine. Um, Eric and I have been taking notes. We've been looking at chat and we've been looking at the Q&A. And I think Eric's going to start off with a question. Yeah, we got one from Sil uh, Sylvia. Uh, and just to paraphrase, um, Elaine, she's mentioning that audiences are scarce nowadays and that we have we face this new reality where we're really trying to reach out to a, broaden, a broader audience and be accessible to more. Um, and that this is something they're actively doing in Mexico specifically. Um, any thoughts on this endeavor and how we as museum folks make our spaces more appealing? And I would just add in, not as part of Sil Sylvia's um, question, but this idea of the community, the museum is a community asset, I think maybe it falls into place here with her, her question. Well, once you look at all the assets, the next part is to ask a big, wide representative swath of your community what they want from you. And you have to be prepared to do it or to at least contemplate it. And what they want from you may surprise you because it is not what you traditionally think you do um, in Ecuador. Uh, a community surrounding a museum wanted their political leverage to keep them grandfathered in their homes so that they would be not gentrified out of their homes. And the museum, because it was intended to do that and had a category of neighbors, did just that. So the simple answer is ask them at the next um, decision is very difficult because you need to be prepared to do that. What are your hours? Um, where is food served? Um, what can the community who has a scarcity uh, make use of in your place? Where you will be surprised what you get asked for. And the other thing is that uh, you have to get used to the fact that people don't ask for the same thing and these are not necessarily overlapping. I, I always use this example that people at the Mona Lisa now, crowd at the Mona Lisa and now have a take selfie sticks and the purists hate that. And so the purists are angry at the selfie stickers. And my sense is, well, that's a timing issue. And can't we go look at what we do at swimming pools, which is this is the hour for this or the 15 minutes for this, no children. This is the 45 minutes with the children. So it's not only you have to ask them, but you have to get used to the fact that what they'll ask for is not the same as each other. And that providing it doesn't have to overlap each other, but in fact might also need you to look at your timing. Interesting. Well, thanks, Aileen. I have actually a question that, that may be a good add on to that, which is you said earlier in your talk um, about hoping the museums would think about indoor and outdoor spaces sort of together, more blended, and then later used the word thresh threshold and that with the pandemic, the threshold changed. 
um, and, may, and, and some museums were making better use of outdoor space. I'm wondering your thoughts on um, online space, which is a whole different way of thinking about threshold and accessibility. Um, do you have any thoughts about museums using online space in this I, regard? I had more is better for me. I, I don't. I, I'm against winners and losers. I'm, I wanted to title my book the importance of and and i've written two papers that use that title because i like the title and is the important thing for me so yes you should have uh online space and yes you should be exploring the biggest thing you can do online because human beings are multivaried they go to school at certain times and they go to church at other times and they go to the movies at another time and then they go to um to Disney at even another time, then they go home and read their books. Should museums participate in all of that? Why not? And so this either or, even teleology that asks me to make a decision, I try to resist. Excellent. Um, Rita, I've got another couple that I might uh, summarize. So we've got a question from Joe and from Esther, which are similar in nature. And it's kind of going back to this idea of uh, is there forgiveness in the room for learning? And I think I would connect it to your personal storytelling remark and about how each of us has a physical body that we reside in and we you know, have, to have to come to terms with that within society. Um, but that sometimes, you know, kind of to take uh, Esther's point, um, guilt can kind of be an obstacle to actually uh, overcoming the, the and, and, and getting into dialogue. So both of those questions are just asking for a little more expansion on, on this idea that you shared. Well, and let me put another ingredient down, which I feel really important and I don't want to leave out, and that's civility. There is, in fact, what I refer to as this far and no further. It's not always the same location, but there is this notion that all human beings deserve a civil response to them. Those who are angry and aggrieved. Um, also, we all need to be in a, in a room together in which recognition of the humanness of us all is seen and therefore we can begin a dialogue. What often gets in the way is a self-editor because I'm guilty, but also a, an entitlement because I've been aggrieved and therefore I'm allowed to be accusatory. And both of those are conversation stoppers. And so the way in which we need to make welcome and safety in the room has to do with, I'm not talking about actions that are uh, aggressive. The easiest one is, of course, I'm not talking about violence, but the next one is, can we make the rhetoric and the learning happen in some, I use, hate to use the word of uh, love, or in some notion of peace that all of us are gonna come out of this process intact, but have moved forward toward each other. And that's a hard lesson. And there is, and that's negotiated with each of your museums, there is intolerable edges. Where that is, where the end of civility is, both to your staff and each other, um, needs to also be talked about at all times. So this actually lends itself very much to um, another question from an attendee, Norwood. It's actually a three-part question. He, uh, they say, how might your fear have been met and calmed before centering? Is there a quality of empathy that would have given you a sense of inclusion and what did you find or discover within yourself before you came to the philosophy of centering well let me do the that these are 
fabulous questions. Let me do the last one first. Um, fear is the overarching uh, emotion of my childhood. Um, and the overarching of, of American-born immigrant children of German Jewish immigrants have very hard time understanding the difference between you're in a safe environment and there is an unsafe environment. And so it all gets transferred and it's horrifying. So I have spent all, that's the light motif of the emotional content of my life. And I've spent my life trying to figure out as a parent, where is the robust safety? Not the, where is the notion where you are both street savvy and still are going to go forward? Where are you going to venture out? Where is safe and where is not? And can you move that back? And so increasingly I'm, I was interested in the world of welcome. What does welcome look like? What does um, cordiality look like? What does empathy look like? Um, I wrote a chapter for the empathy book. Um, and interestingly um, for both Aleph and for me, the, world, the word empathy translated in both Arabic and in, um, in Yiddish is Rachmonis or Rachman. Um, and it means understanding the human condition and having some sense that we are all flawed, but we are all capable of unspeakable bad as well as unspeakable good. But I didn't answer all, all his, I didn't answer all his parts, but there is. That's okay. I, I feel like I, I need to sit with that for a minute. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. There's so much that you're bringing to the table, Elaine. And I think a lot of uh, us are thinking about it, including the, all the attendees. This we're getting some great, great thoughts. I think um, we have time for one more question. Great. Eric, Eric, do you have one? If not, I've, I've got like 10, but. <laughs> Mine is from attendees, huh? So yeah, let me, I think I think Walt. Well, there was one specifically. Let's see. That was uh, um, maybe maybe this is just an add-on from Lynn. Is there a, is there more of a national role for museums to actually help shift the public discourse so that we can learn to listen and learn yeah. from each other in a less divisive way? I think that's a nice follow-up. Yes, the answer is yes, and the answer is back to it's a good. It's a good circle back to Walter. Everyone, the national museums have a big role to play. They understand that they're national. I understand I've worked on the national. The little ones have an equal role to play because civility and the way in which you deal with your local citizens happens in small places and in small neighborhoods and small podcasts and small everything. So the way in which every museum can look at its span of control and think about what way they can make their institution more accessible and more useful to a broad range of people on their own terms, the more peaceable the country will be. There is a great deal of work, for example, by the police about why public parks need to be open all day. And that turns out because if everybody uses them and are strangers, the, the um, fear and also the violence goes down. That in very small ways, that when the public buses are used, they're used because some driver is making a difference in a route that the word goes out, that's a safe route. So I don't think anybody doing any work at any scale should minimize their work, that the nation is made up of atoms and that the more we do this notion that we are responsible for the public climate, the better we are. 
Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to stop here because we are exactly at the one hour point here. Uh, Elaine, thank you so much for, for this very lively conversation. I hope I'm very good that, that, that I did uh, honor to your job <laughs> and uh, that, that you're happy with the, with the outcome. Uh, I think, Elaine, I can say that if people have more questions, and there's no doubt they can write to you and you'll be happy to talk Absol to them, right? Uh, so, yes. So please do so. If you, if you have, you go to Elaine's website and you can connect with her directly there. Uh, so that's a, that's a way of doing. I want to uh, thank also Americo for showing up because that was quite brave from him uh, in, this, in this condition to do that and show up and, and, and take responsibility for an engagement. And we certainly will come back to you, Americo, for, for another event, uh, maybe more targeted to, uh, to the, the South American, Latino American uh, community. Uh, I also want to thank again uh, AAM for the support that they give. And uh, I want to always, and I, I need to do this, all the volunteers from Museum Expert to make this possible. We have a group of 15 to 20 people who, who really are extremely active and pay a lot of their time in, in making this uh, a success. And there is space, space for other. We're really looking forward to, to have more people joining us. And, and we have a lot of areas where we need to improve in social media and in website and all of and marketing and all of that. So if you feel any of that, uh, is, is a, one of your strengths and you're going to give us a, a little bit of uh, time every week we, we're happy to welcome you and uh, uh, and then and host you as a volunteer it's a it's a great team and and we do great things so uh, and also you have seen we cannot do that uh, I'll continue that on a higher level without some support so we have now partnered with the network for good and there is a donate button on our website so please yeah, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> you can oh. <laughs> you can go to the website and click on that button and give us a little bit of support so that we can uh, improve the tools that we that we uh, that we create for for serving you. Thanks to the attendees uh, for joining us uh, with a large group today, and uh, we hope to see you again in the very near future. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Probably could stop recording, Rita, if you haven't already, too. Yeah.